locked room is the murderer of your father, Miss Bromsbury, and I will provide irrefutable proof of their guilt. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. You made the right choice to leave London. It is unbearably foggy. But Lavinia, darling, what's going on? She knows. But how? I, I mean, what? What does she know? I don't understand. Whatever do you mean? Oh no, you understand me clearly, Mr. Harrington, and you also, Spencer, or should I say, Mr. Jeffreys? Explain yourself, Mr. Holmes. What a monstrous misunderstanding! Oh, I've just explained myself to Miss Bromsby about the truth of her father's murder, but I can tell the story again from the very beginning. It begins several years ago. Wyatt Collins, the nephew of Mr. Bromsby, is forced by his uncle to leave England for South America. His hatred is fostered by the ingratitude he perceives in Sir Bromsby. Wasn't his uncle's career financed by his mother's money? In Collins' mind, Melvin Bromsby owes him an eternal debt of gratitude, and was thus obliged to finance Collins' indolent lifestyle, fulfilling his every need. Here is our first criminal, Wyatt Collins. Then we have you, Mr. Harrington. You were a brilliant student at the Military Academy and are an excellent shot, are you not? You were the only person at the reception with sufficient skills to make the shot that took Sir Bromsby's life. During my investigation, I learned that ex-officers of Her Majesty's Army enjoy great favour around the world for administrative positions. You left India and made your way to Brazil. Where you obtained the position as warden of the prison in Guaquiamo, do not try to deny your presence there. The pictures in your hunting portfolio could have been taken nowhere else in the world except Guaquiamo. We now have our second criminal, Lieutenant Harrington. Mr. Jeffreys, your arrival in Guaquiamo set things in motion. The theatre company had come to Brazil as part of their worldwide tour. You had been involved with the lovely Veronica Davenport and loved her with a passionate yet possessive love. However, Miss Davenport did not share your affections. She had, in fact, tried several times to end your affair prior to the company's arrival in Guaquiamo. It seems she was truly devoted to Dwight Richards and would never leave him. After you arrived, you frequented the town's bawdier spots. This is where you first met Mr. Harrington, and you quickly became close companions. It seems tedium and heartbreak do bring certain people together. After the performance, maddened by alcohol and grief, you killed Miss Davenport because she had rejected your love. You then fled to your newfound friend, the warden, to confess your crime and beg for his help. In a show of friendship, he helped dispose of her corpse and directed suspicions towards your rival, Dwight Richards. Afterwards, you lay low, leaving the others to believe that you had been killed or had gone missing. You stayed hidden until they had departed, and you must have kept Miss Davenport's earring as some morbid souvenir. No doubt you also retained not only the key to the Fairfax Theatre, but the keys from Aston's, where you had been employed several years earlier. Here then is our third felon, Mr. Jeffreys. Life was difficult in Brazil for our trio. Mr. Jeffreys rarely went out. Mr. Harrington's men were talking behind his back, and Mr. Collins' funds were inadequate. One evening, Collins spoke of his cousin, who, in a few months' time, was to return to England from finishing school. She was also the sole heir to one of the greatest fortunes in England. Imagine these three men besotted with alcohol, considering the wealth that would one day pass to this slip of a girl. A terrible plan was devised. Several days later, they left for England, false papers for two of their party in hand, resolved to seize a portion, if not all, of this great inheritance. Incredible, yes, incredible, and horribly true. At first, their plan was to forge a duplicate will or destroy the original, so that Mr. Collins would receive a share of the estate. This would happen soon enough, as they would murder Sir Bromsby at his daughter's birthday reception. It was essential that Collins enter the country under false papers, so that neither his uncle nor the authorities would be alerted to his presence in England. This would avoid any suspicion attaching him for his uncle's death when he arrived to claim his inheritance. They quickly put their plans into effect. Mr. Jeffreys arrived at the household in the guise of a stylish French head waiter and studied the lay of the manor, 
Mr. Harrington, the assassin, would accompany a person with rather poor eyesight to the reception so that the illusion of the fake Mr. Harrington would go unchallenged. As the head waiter, Jeffries was in a unique position to study the guest list. He quickly learned that two of the guests, Miss Roundtree and Colonel Patterson, had both poor eyesight and were unaccompanied. Lieutenant Harrington was quite busy in the days before the reception. He courted Miss Roundtree with great dedication and made fast friends with the Colonel. He hoped to secure one, if not two, invitations to the reception. Your arrival as the Colonel's guest was your first error, Harrington. Is it credible that a young officer who left the army because of his hatred towards all military authority would easily befriend a man who embodies everything that he detests? But your efforts bore fruit, and you obtained your invitation. Mr. Jeffries, as head waiter, took great care that the tables and table clothes were arranged specifically to accommodate their schemes. Mr. Jeffries then secured the disguise for his role as the false Lieutenant Harrington. He remembered that an officer's uniform, similar to Lieutenant Harrington's, and a red wig, identical to the colouring of the Lieutenant's hair, were in storage at the Fairfax Theatre. He learned that the company had taken up residence at the site of the old Aston Theatre, for which he still had the key. It was therefore a simple matter for him to acquire these items for his masquerade. They now only lacked the will, which Mr. Collins presumed was kept at Flowlet's house. Their plan was to take these papers prior to the murder of Sir Bromsbeer, so that Flowlet would be unaware of either their presence or substitution until it was too late. But things went badly. Mr. Jeffries tried to divert Mr. Flowlet, but he must have been alerted by some noise as Collins struggled vainly to open the safe. Upon being discovered, Collins killed Flowlet on the spot. The two conspirators then left the house in such a way that witnesses believed it was Fowlett himself who had left. They would now have to find another way to get hold of the money, because no doubt Sir Bromsby had disinherited Collins in favour of his daughter. They decided to take the money from his daughter, a young, naive and vulnerable young woman. On the day of reception, Mr. Harrington arrived with Jeffreys, disguised as his servant Spencer and the Colonel. With the promise of whiskey, Jeffries easily secured the unwitting aid of two fellow servants and assumed a position at the service door. He wagered that he could pinch two or three good bottles of liquor from the kitchen if his companions would cover for him. I have just explained what happened next. After the shooting, he took two bottles of excellent whiskey. Only someone knowledgeable would have taken these two bottles over the others and Mr. Jeffries had been formerly employed at a luxurious hotel in France. Upon his return, he gave an accounting to his fellow servants, did his hair, and left the manor. The promised delivery of the liquor and his frightened look secured the two men's cooperation in providing his alibi. They could not have known his true role in these events. The one problem for the conspirators was the barman, Simon Hunter. He had perfect eyesight, unlike the colonel, and realized that the man who claimed to be near the bar at the time of the murder had in fact lied. He hinted as much to Mr. Harrington and most certainly intended blackmail. As they were short on funds, the accomplices gave him Miss Davenport's earring as collateral and pledged to return with the money he demanded. That night, when Lieutenant Harrington visited us in London, he had just come from Simon Hunter's. Hunter had told Harrington that the earring had been pawned and he would not reveal the name of the shop unless Harrington paid him his money. Mr. Harrington ruthlessly killed Hunter and the earring so precious to Mr. Jeffries was lost. Earlier that morning, Jeffries lured Collins to the cement factory on the pretext of fabricating false evidence against Grimble. But they no longer needed Collins to acquire the Bromsby fortune. Mr. Harrington would wed the young heiress, then, after a reasonable time, they would cause her untimely death and they would take it all. So Mr. Jeffries murdered Collins and made sure his body was barely recognizable. If he was identified, it would not affect their plans, as they believed leaving the corpse at the cement factory would direct suspicion towards Grimble. When Mr. Harrington came to see us, he learned we were hot on Collins' trail and had traced his movements up to the factory. He assumed he would go there within the hour and left to quickly round up his associates and devise a plan. 
Jeffries, from his days at the Fairfax Theatre, knew an Asian of questionable talents who had no visible ties with this case and could attack us without drawing suspicion their way. We avoided this attack, and from that moment, I was convinced of Lieutenant Harrington's involvement in the conspiracy.